Anne Johansson is a professor in mechanics and vice president for research at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Uh, Johansson has experienced from six years as the general secretary for natural and engineering sciences at the Swedish Research Council, as well as from the boards and evaluation groups of several other funding agencies. Johansson is also head of the Linnea Flow Center, which is one of the 20 Linnea centers we started in 2006. He will talk about publication assessment and university governance. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Young Academy for inviting me and giving me a chance here to speak a little bit about the, an issue that's quite important, quite complex, and interesting both for the individual researcher as well as for the university leadership. So uh, <clears throat> I'm delighted to see so many young scientists here today. Next week, the crowd will be a little bit older when we sit here and vote about the Nobel Prizes. But uh, for all of us, I guess, the main issue, uh, essential issue here, is to identify excellent research and how we do that. We got a very good illustration in the previous talk about how complex this issue is. And uh, first of all, we must be feel the humility, we must be humble about this, that we really have no perfect way of doing this. So we have to live in an imperfect world, fudging around with different tools to do this. And today I will speak mostly from my perspective in the KTH leadership and my experience in this world about well, how we do publication assessment today and uh, how it comes into the university governance. And uh, this publication assessment is really part of what's called today the metric tide. The, uh, it's all part in uh, an important part in university rankings, and we see this ranking system, the trend to use metrics everywhere, to use evaluations of different kinds as a really increasing factor in all of this and becoming an important part in the scientific world. And how do we deal with that? Well, we see this tide of metrics with measurements of all kinds combined with popularity polls reputation of universities is becoming an important factor in, in many of these international rankings. And if you think the, uh, the usual metrics is an uncertain and, uh, and uh, very discuss well, worth disputable way of, of measuring things, the popularity polls, which is a very important part in rankings, is, I would say, an even murkier business. Why do they come about? Well, there are about 20,000 universities or, or something of that kind to, uh, that are competing to become established in the world. And there is a concept of world-class universities. I'll come back to what the ranking institutes how they define it. And the competition is, is about prestige on the university level, the uh, national level, and it's also about access to the best undergraduate students, the best PhD students, the best postdocs. And we see this in a world where we can expect the international mobility of everybody in this field going from undergraduate students and up to really increase. And they will look for the best universities. Where should I go? And uh, so this is really some kind of declaration of, of the uh, universities that this aims at. And you can see, especially in Asia, what how the, the role of these rankings, how that comes in 
in the choice of uh, which universities to go to. This is, of course, not always rational, but it's used a lot. And it's becoming increasingly influential to the access of the best faculty, the ranking, the standing and the ranking systems. You can see it, one uh, influence of this was when Germany realized that their universities were not all that high up on the list of the international rankings, so they all of a sudden pumped in a lot of money into a few what they thought would be become elite universities. And these rankings also have the influence on international funding, actually. The definition that uh, these ranking institutes you often use is a long list of complicated things where they talk about uh, the universities who are economic, important for the economic development and are dominated by high quality research, etc., etc. But it all boils down to that it's the top 500 on their lists. That's what they define as the world class university. And uh, you can see many of the effects of this. And just as an example, that there are large efforts in, in countries like India, in Russia, Malaysia, China, etc., to get universities up to the top 200 list. And uh, some agreements on master student exchange only allow actually these to be transferred between universities that are, are among these top 200. So there's a lot of influence. Of course, there's even higher prestige, a special role to be on the top 100. You can see some of the signs of the importance of ranking with the, the national strategies where countries actually start merging universities with the explicit goal of increasing their standing in the international rankings. That happened in the UK with the universities in Manchester, you saw it recently in France, in Paris, and uh, you can also see it motivated fusions between universities and research institutes. Happened in Denmark, in DTU, happened in Karlsruhe. And it's been explicitly said in these circumstances that ranking was an argument. And India and other countries have decided that their universities can only collaborate with the top 400 universities. A rather odd example how rankings come in is that, that even uh, residence permits is formally actually used as a, an argument in, in, in actually when the authorities decide about residence permit to countries. That's starting to happen. This is rather absurd, but uh, <laughs> I mean, these things happen today. You see, the, uh, this is just to illustrate the, this, the influence of these ranking systems. And big companies start to give strict preferences to alumni that come from high-ranked universities before they start evaluating their actual credentials. Uh, well, you can see also this is becoming maybe not a biblical proportions, but the Matthias effect, where you say that to those who have shall be given, well, if you are high up in the ranking systems, you will get more resources and have the possibilities to, to get even further. If you look at the national ranking systems, well, we, the REF in the UK, which was earlier the uh, RAE, is, has, a lar has had a large influence not only in UK, but inspiring other countries. And even in Sweden, the Swedish Research Council has proposed a system similar to that, which has not been decided upon yet. In the REF, one measures societal impact of all fields of science. And uh, it's created a large database of case studies that is now being used for research in itself, actually. 
peer review is used, bibliometrics is used, and this report came out as uh, maybe also reflecting, uh, reflecting upon this ref, and uh, it's called the metric tide. You see chapters like judgment and peer review, management by metrics, reflections on, uh, on uh, the ref, etc. And uh, well, we, I think most of us agree that peer review is, in many of these circumstances, the only sort of really system that where we can rely on the outcome to some extent on the average. In the individual sense, of course, it can never be perfect. And, uh, well, when uh, Darwin tried to submit his, his work on the origin of species, he's, he was first rejected with the comment that he should actually study pigeons instead or something like that, which was very, sort of, the comment was cool. The, in that report, there's a chapter on what they call responsible metrics, and I've just copied these uh, things from that report. They also have this, this uh, homepage, responsiblemetrics.org. They have five different things mentioned there, and maybe the most important one is the humility, recognizing that quantitative evaluation support but not supplant qualitative expert assessment. So we should realize that, that we should not let it get, become a too big thing here in, in uh, assessment in general. Despite that, the trend is more or less the opposite, as we've seen. They talk about that if we have these systems of metrics one should aim for robust, robustness in terms of basing metrics on the best possible data. Transparency, that uh, keeping data collection and analytical processes open and transparent, at least that's a basic. And diversity to count by, for variation by field and using range of indicators to reflect and support plurality of research. And also, the last point is a bit interesting, that they use reflexivity, recognizing and anticipating the system and potential effects of indicators, and updating them in response, which essentially means all systems with indicators will tend to corrupt themselves, and uh, then they so suggest that systems should be adaptable here. We also mention three points directly they, in reflection upon this, that the research community should develop more sophisticated and nuanced approach to the contribution and limitations of quantitative indicators. We cannot just sit and say that these systems will, will disappear. They are here to stay. University leaders should develop a, a clear statement on principles and their approach to research management and assessment, meaning that, well, if we use this, we should openly declare what are we after, what, what are in, our aims with this. And the last, I think we skip here. If you look at how these systems, the ranking systems, evolve, there's a real keen interest on the, on the methodology and accuracy. You see, for instance, the number of, of interviews, the number of inputs to these systems is rapidly increasing. So you have a huge number of inputs. If that makes them more accurate, one can argue about. Uh, there is more focus on citations than rather on number of publications, which is maybe good at least. Uh, there are some recent modifications, even in the QS, that they evaluated, taking more care. They were actually using more field normalizations to, to actually value different fields in a more uh, accurate way. 
that actually meant that some of the technical universities actually got a bit higher up, small portion up on, on these lists. The role of bibliometrics in all these ranking systems is fairly large, but not dominating in, in the ranking systems. But in themselves, they have become sort of important for allocation of resources between and within universities. And uh, also, people use them for identifying possible collaboration partners. It's a tool, and uh, it's used in recruitment. And uh, there, of course, one should make it a very small part in, in the relation to expert assessment. But it's, it's a danger that it's so easy to use here, of course. And uh, we see this growing in the bibliometri bibliometrics field that these databases are using, have a wider range of publications that they take in. Some of the dangers we see that was mentioned in the previous talk also is the danger that people tend to become more conservative. If you get into a new field, it's, it's difficult to start publishing quickly. That's absolutely a feel that and must be then met by other means if this is used. It's often stated that, uh, well, if we start with the anecdote I was thinking about is that I heard from a party where there had been a thesis defense and the opponent spoke at the party, started saying that this thesis actually contained no complicated mathematics, no complicated conclusions, no, essentially no new theory. And at that stage, the, the candidate became quite nervous, and his can but he, the opponent really f finished off by saying, such a lightly digestible thesis have a good chance to become read and cited. <laughs> and uh, that's, of course, is this true that uh, it's this danger that complex theory in papers, is it really so that papers with that tend to become, get fewer citations? Yes, it might on the scale, but I, I tried to test it at KTH by looking at some of our leading mathematicians, and it turned out that they were more, even more well cited than I had thought, so it didn't really hold too well there. Is it a myth that uh, some of that applied areas have a disadvantage in this system, maybe to some extent. If we talk more directly about KTH, the, we're ranked as 126 at times higher education, and it's got a bit higher recently, partly because of this change in how they evaluated publications by QS. Some of the strengths that we see in these ranking systems, why we get this high up, at least in the lists, is the, that we have some very strong areas, like four or five areas, that in, among all these universities in the world are in the top 20, top 30 uh, list in the world. Large number of publications per faculty, large fraction of co-publication in the industry and a fairly high fraction of international co-publication, etc. But if you look at the details here, if you look at other institutes who, want, who actually try to measure scientific impact and excellence, we're not quite as good as that standing in, in overall standing. And we have relatively few highly cited papers in high-impact journals. And we see that papers that have only, only scientists from Sweden are, are, have a low citation level in comparison with even some other countries. That are some detail. And relatively few highly cited researchers. 
what can we do then to, if we want to get further up into the university rankings? Well, increased quality in the long-term sense is, I think, for university like us, is to, to focus on establishing and uh, recruiting young stars, young excellent researchers, and in the assessment there, I definitely think, as with the previous, that that has to be done through a very thorough type of expert assessment and to a very small extent the, the bibliometrics. Despite that, we want to focus on, uh, we want to stimulate publication in high impact journals, saying that we want people to, to focus more on quality and less on quantity, to think a bit more before they publish. Stimulate in that respect also to get the new ideas tested in, in international collaborations, to go abroad, seek, seek the leading uh, university groups around the world to start collaborations, use sabbaticals, go out there and uh, go to the international leading facilities infrastructures and uh, do the research. And uh, we want to stimulate the, the um, stronger research constellations and so forth. I think we... So in essence, to, if we look even at, at uh, doctoral thesis, that's been too much of a focus on the number of publications. I think in many universities in Sweden and elsewhere, there are often typically rules about the number of uh, publications that should be in that thesis. I think that we should probably reduce that, the tendency, reduce the number of publications and go out to many conferences, discuss your results, and before you before you publish in, and try to get them into high quality journals. If that's equivalent to high impact journals, well, some of the tools we have to live with what we have today. But uh, to focus on the quality instead of quantity there, I think is the best for also the individual researchers. And uh, we do a bibliometric uh, follow-up on a yearly follow-up where but that's also been mostly in, as it should be used as a tool for, I think we skipped the detail of that. And uh, our conclusion at, at KG is, is actually that our reputation is maybe better than our <laughs> academic impact. So probably publish too much in some sense and uh, focus on quality and uh, good journals we need good journals. We need some, actually, the community as such needs actually to be able to assess which journals are of high quality. Where do we have the stringent tests for, for scientific quality? In this world of, of easy publication, I think that need is even larger than it was before. So, publish smarter and prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Arne Johansson. Uh, I will start with a Twitter question before I will see if there are any more questions here. Uh, and the Twitter question I got was, how make contributions to software, for example, GitHub contributions and databases count towards publication metrics? So how do the contributions to databases and all that? Well, to the metrics, I'm not sure actually. There, I mean, in, it's a developing system, so what you can see is that more and more types of publications are coming into to these large databases that Scopus, Web of Science, and others are used. So you can only just guess what the development is, but uh, you can probably see that new types of publications will, <clears throat> will enter into those. Anyone out there who want to pose another question? 
I've been at a number of workshops the last year where people have discussed things like including open science in the university reward systems or including publishing code, publishing data sets and so on. Is that something you see a possibility to include in your publication indicators or is, is it still too premature for universities? No, it's possible, absolutely. And uh, I think contributions of that kind can be evaluated within the university that you're, you're taking your part in the scientific development of, of your own field in that way. I think that's, that's quite possible and probably a good idea. I don't think we do it in a, to any extent at the moment, but it, it would be fairly easy to, to include that. So what would be required for that to actually happen? Uh, well, it, as I said, it, it would be easy to implement. So, I mean, it, it's more or less just changing the system by writing it into the rules that we have. So it's, it, it's fairly simple. Okay, I will also ask one more Twitter question, and uh, it's about, would it be better for a nation, for example, Sweden, to go to a good university like the Stockholm University, KTH, Karolinska, and merge those in order to get higher ranking? Yeah, that's what I, mean, that's what I mentioned. This, this is happening all around the world today, that nations are using it. I don't think we should fall into that trap, actually, that we would certainly re increase our ranking quite a bit if we would do that. I'm sure about that. But uh, I'm, I'm not so sure that it's, it would give so, so many different uh, administrative nightmares to do that. So I would, uh, can you personally, just, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Would, but can't you just make an umbrella organization and just keep them pretty much Maybe like one could, own? maybe. And we're, I mean, what we're doing today is a very intensive collaboration with Karolinska and the Stockholm University, like the SciLife Lab, which is an excellent example of where you have put lots of uh, research, effort, research resources into something where people do really basic science and have lots of people involved there. So, but to do, it, to do the administrative part of this, I don't know. Yeah, it's trying to play the system a bit, but I, I think maybe one should stay out of that, maybe. Okay, thank you, Arne Johansson again.